welcome to the Anxious Child Podcast, the podcast that helps you best work with anxious kids and teens. Now, here's your host, Stephen Quinlan. Hey everyone, today on the show we have Ari Gunsberg. Ari details his story of early life trauma when he was 10 years old and how this affected his life deeply and changed his perspective forever. Ari says that he graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, and as we talk about today, we get a better sense of what that meant for him. It's an interesting conversation in that it starts where the roots of his trauma took place, which are in the wilderness and in the woods, and then eventually ends up back at that place, but this time in in terms of how he uses being outside and being in the woods to help heal himself and also pass that along to others. There's some really great messages and takeaways in here today ones that mostly revolve around routine, getting outside, being in nature, and how this helps to make us feel better quickly and naturally, and also using small little victories to overcome our fear of things which might be holding us back. A quick update on how things are going kind of behind the scenes here at the Anxious Child podcast. Uh, One of the things I wanted to share with you today is some of the new music that I'm going to be incorporating into the podcast, which was uh, composed pretty amazingly, I think, by my 15-year-old son. So I'm going to put that in here so you guys can check it out. Let me know what you think. The other thing is that as part of kind of the new offering, the podcast itself is also being somewhat redesigned and putting into a new and I think pretty cool, exciting format with the hope of helping helping out uh, also a lot of the therapists that are out there and listening to this and ideally helping you guys not only take care of your clients, but also take care of yourselves. So in the meantime, let's listen to the inspiring story of Ari Gunsberg and getting back to nature. Enjoy. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to hear your story and talk about the, I know you had kind of some early trauma that you experienced as a kid, how that may or may not have influenced some anxiety that you had, and then sort of led you down this wild path to where you are at the moment. So yeah, why don't we just kind of start back at the beginning sort of when you were a little guy and running around and take it from there uh, <laughs> so go ahead. Go. Just, just start with your life and uh, on one one ahead. on one crazy day in april i was born now yes um, i was also born on a crazy day in april <laughs> were you uh, yeah. what's your birthday yeah april 20th nice i'm april 6th yeah. so okay. um actually there's a band at one point there was a band called april 6th Oh yeah. So my friends like walking around with like a baseball cap or a trucker's cap or something. And it said April 6th on it. I'm like, dude, why is my birthday on your hat? (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, it's not my birthday. It's a band. I'm like, all right, whatever, man. Get it right. Yeah. Yeah. The the Um, joke I always get is my birthday is on 420. So people are like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about that, but yeah. Yeah. When I was younger, you know. (laughs) Then you were thinking about that. Yes. Then I was thinking about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. You were born on 420. (laughs) It's so Cool. Yeah. yeah, I got that a lot. Awesome, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so when I was a kid, I went through a lot. I mean, I'm assuming you're probably just trying to jump straight to like when I was 10 years old, probably. Yeah. I saw that. I'm not, I don't know the details of what it was that happened, yeah. but I know you had um, this event. Yeah. Right. So, so I was a little kid and I was, I'm like trying to like bring my mind back into that space for a second. Uh, mm. Just, we've been on like a really long, like, holidays vacation like stuff stuff like that so like trying to get back into the swing of things so when i was like 10 years old we had this rabbi it was actually let's start from the here this spot i guess is a good spot to start it was it was a really weird thing that is one of those things i think that only kind of starts making sense later but he was an eighth grade teacher for a long time like talking like 25 30 years he always taught eighth grade that's the grade that he taught And for some inexplicable reason, the school decided to switch him from being in eighth grade to being in fourth grade that year. Why exactly? 
I don't, I, I never even got that answer. The principal who was in charge at the time has since passed away. It's like, I don't have any clarity on the real reason that they came up with to do it. But I, between you and me, I can tell you that I, I believe the reason to be because God was pushing the buttons and being like, these kids need to have this person as a teacher. And this is his last year left on earth. So we're just going to push him into being the fourth grade teacher. So that's like a little preamble, I guess, a little bit of foreshadowing also, you know, uh, guess yeah. what? <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, so he was our teacher and, you know, we went through the full year with him almost. And then there is a, a day in, usually I think it's in May time that, that people tend to celebrate by going out and taking hikes and maybe playing baseball, maybe having a bonfire. Like the, if you look in Israel, I don't know if you remember, probably I think around May time, there was a big tragedy where like a bunch of people got trampled. I think it made the main world news. I do remember that. That was several years yeah. ago, but I do remember that. That was yeah. this year. That was this year. Oh, this year. I thought you were that talking just about happened. something else even. Oh, okay. No, that, oh. yeah, no, that just happened this year. It happened in a place called Meron. Okay, I'm not familiar. Which is near the burial place of a rabbi who was like a big proponent of this holiday and stuff and whatever. So like people often gather at the, this tomb to sit there and celebrate this thing with bonfires and dancing and all sorts of other stuff. So, so this, that's, that's the setting of the stage. And, and we were supposed to have a trip on the day of, and my friend said that it didn't happen because the rabbi had like a doctor's appointment that day. I rem I thought it didn't happen that day because it was on Friday or Sunday. I mean, it's been, it's been so many years, it's hard to tell why, but it, it happened. It ended up being postponed a few days. So we went out on this, you know, special trip that we were kind of like owed or whatever because of the date that it was. And we go and we play baseball for a while. And then we, you know, okay, like after we play baseball, we're going to go for a hike. And so we're off in the woods. We're hiking this. And this rabbi was like, you know, check out these trees, check out this ecosystem and check out how this happens and check out how that happens. Because every, every moment was a teachable moment, you know? Mm. And, you know, there's, this is back in the nineties. So like, you know, nowadays it's like, you know, uh, you know, you'd have 20 cha chaperones for 15 kids and, right. you know, nobody better go anywhere without being a parent being around, et cetera. But like back then it was like, all right, it's only 17 kids. I'm just going to take it myself. Mm -hmm. And so we went off for a hike with just us and our rabbi and we're going through the woods. And as, as we're going through the woods, you know, some of us are like, can we run ahead a little bit, you know? And basically he like gave us permission to go ahead, you know, as I'm talking, I'm like thinking like, how bad is that the people they we went ahead because if we had taken a wrong turn on the trail, but whatever, you know, could find it again it's in the nineties. Different times. And he, yeah, different times, first of all. Second of all, he, he may have known I know he went hiking a lot with his family. He may have known the trail really well. Mm -hmm. And I also don't have this memory specifically, but he may have been like, just stay straight and don't turn off the trail at all. And that would make a big difference as well. A bunch of us ended up ahead and we found a stream and we started playing in the stream, right? Boys, we boys, a bunch of 10 year old boys. Like, you know, what, what, what are we going to do? Oh, there's water. Let's play. Yeah. So we started, you know, even older boys, like we'll still like just go play in the stream and be like, oh, it's really cool. You know, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. so we're playing in the stream. And after a while, some kids like surface in the woods behind us. And my memory paints it that there was like, we're at the bottom of this hill and there was like hill going up into the woods. And so they came like out enough, but to be able to see us, but they're still on this hill, like looking down at us and they start screaming down at us, you know, Rebbe's hurt, Rebbe's hurt, something's not okay. And we're like, nobody, it just doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. like nobody took them seriously at all. Mm -hmm. And here they are, they're trying to tell us and trying to communicate to us that something's really wrong and that something's going on. And we're kind of like, yeah, no. Mm -hmm. So we're basically ignoring them because we thought they were joking. Yeah. After, yeah, you know, it, it, there, there's not that long of them screaming like, he's hurt, he's hurt, before we're like, okay, maybe they're not joking. So we turn around, ran up the hill to go back with them, and we come up on this clearing. And imagine, you know, so it's, it's springtime, so there's like some buds and there's some green starting to show up again. There's leaves all over the ground. And there's kids just sitting and standing around him and we come up and it's a completely and totally surreal moment because there our rabbi is just laying prone on the ground hmm. and, and everybody's just standing around or sitting around and one kid's completely and totally hysterical, just screaming at the rabbi. Rabbi, rabbi, same, is mostly interchangeable. He's screaming at him. He's like, rabbi, get up, get up. What's wrong with you? What are you doing? Get up. It's not funny anymore. Uh, trying to, to change the course of history by, by screaming, laughing loud enough which you know doesn't sometimes i guess works but doesn't always and uh, so we show up in this clearing and you know a few we we basically are like okay it's time to go for help and so a few of us go in one direction me and two other kids 
and seven other kids go in another direction and, and we're all convinced that we're right. You know, we're going the right way. No, we're going the right way. No, we're going the right way. But basically we couldn't see, to ter- come to terms and everything. So we went the one direction we thought was the right way and they went the other direction they thought that was the right way. And, uh, you know, about seven kids stayed back behind with the rabbi. So we're wandering through the woods and, and, you know, so it's Baltimore and it's coming up on summer. Baltimore is like super humid, mm-hmm. super hot. And, and, you know, a, I don't even know how to describe the climate, but it's just muggy. And we're running through the woods, but at the same time, we're like, we don't know how or why he fell over. So what if the same thing happens to us? We need to be really, really careful. What should we do? So we're like running, 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 stop. (sighs) Running, 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 stop. Okay. You know, because we don't want to overheat it just in case he had overheated. Mm. And then we're still trying to figure out where where do we go? Do we go this way, that way? Where, how do we get out of here? And we're wandering through the woods, trying to figure a way out. And we hear something off in the distance. We're like, oh, well, you know, that's interesting because it's, it sounded like music. And we're like, well, it sounds like a carnival. If there's music, there's people. And if there's people, then there's help. So we said, let's just follow the music. And we started letting the music guide us, guide our way out of the forest. Now, it's one thing I tell people a lot nowadays is, is again, right? We were talking before about, I guess, fate, if you want to call it that, or, you know, God pushing the buttons. And, you know, everybody's entitled to their own beliefs and everything, but you know, where I come from, we believe in that. So Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just give that perspective on it. But basically the only thing that I have to say is it must be God sitting there and being like, yeah, no, today's the day that you're going to be out there doing what you're doing. And the reason I say that is because when we get to the end, when we get, we, we follow the music, we follow the music, we follow the music. We're like, where's the carnival? It's going to be, it's going to be big. It's going to be grand. There's going to be people all over the place, but we're going to be able to tell people what's going on and they'll be able to save us. Mm -hmm. And we show up to the edge of the woods and there's nobody there. There is a single solitary man standing on the edge of the woods, wearing a kilt and playing the bagpipes. Just like the most random thing you can imagine almost. I, uh, the most random thing I can still imagine. You know, I go hiking all the time and I don't see people standing on the edge of the woods. Still haven't bagpipes. seen that. Uh, you know, I come uh, across people kayaking. I come across people sure. paddleboarding. I come across yeah. people biking. Like there's many things I come across people doing, even uh, sometimes in the right places, climbing. Mm-hmm. But not not playing the bagpipes on the edge of the woods, I you know. But but that was the day that he felt the need to go and practice the bagpipes in the by by the edge of the woods, and it was good that he did because I think he not only drew us out of the woods and helped us find the way out, but also you know uh, probably five or ten minutes after we finished getting out of the woods, the other group got out of the woods also, so nobody got lost that day, which is good. Anyways, so we come out, he's playing the bagpipes and we're like, okay, where do we go? What do we do? Because clearly, you know, the guy with the bagpipes is not going to drop what he's doing and run with us and help us. But we saw, we saw like some buildings off in the distance and we picked up, we ran to the buildings. We run inside. We're like, yeah, something happened. And, and we tell him what's going on. And so two guys, they grab a med pack and they come with us and we lead them back through the woods. Thankfully, we're able to figure out exactly the directions we took to get back to where we were. And they show up and one of the guys immediately jumps down and starts doing CPR. The other guy's like, okay, a bunch of 10-year-old kids, time to get out of the woods. So he's like gathering all of us. He's like, come on, guys, let's go. And people are like, we should stay with him. He's like, no, you shouldn't. Let's go. <laughs> let's mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. So he he led us out of the woods. And, uh, you know, so he took all the 10 of us and he's like, let's get out of here. And he led us out of the woods. Throughout the afternoon, the, the, the picture to paint really is a bunch of us kids standing in this like parking lot area, like around at this massive tree and just standing around like completely and totally spooked. No idea what's going on, right? Mm-hmm. At this point, we're all back together. At this point, they've called the, the school and so the administration is there and some of the, uh, our teacher from the year before is there whose van it was we had taken to get over to this park and they're just standing around. They like won't look at us. They won't talk to us. They like just are basically ignoring us. Like stay over there, do your thing over there. We're over here and we're just like, <sighs> we have no idea what's going on. Hmm. So after, after some time that we were standing there waiting to figure out what's going on, the teacher, our teacher from last, the, the year before, our third grade teacher, is whose van it was, was like, everybody get in the van. And he wouldn't, like, stone-faced, poker-faced, wouldn't say a word. He's just like, where do you live? And he would just get to the kid's house. Here you go. And then go to the next person, like, where do you live? And, you know, just drive to that house. And he just drove all around town, dropping kids off their house, one by one, and that was it. And and as you can imagine, for the homes in which these kids were dropped off, it was just like, what in the world is going on? Hmm. You know, my dad eventually, huh? 
I was just to say, how did you find out eventually what your, your oh, dad so, told you? Yeah. So my dad, my dad's like, what's going on? Like, how'd you end up getting home? Like trip. So he called up the school and, and it was, that's also like a, a, a picture that's like painted very, very vividly in my mind. It's just like, you know, he gets on the phone and he's, he's sitting there and he's like, yeah, you know, my name's Dr. Gunsberg. I'm calling. I want to find out, you know, what, you know, my son's dropped off. Like what, what, what happened with the trip? Is he okay? And like, it was just like, he was on the phone and his whole face just dropped. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's like, I see. And he just hangs up the phone and he looks up at me. I'm like standing like down the hall or something. And he's like, he's gone. And, you know, he's like, he just, he, he grabbed me, pulled me into a hug and everything. It was just like, I don't know how long it was. I think it was, I, my memory is it was 45 minutes or something, an hour, just, just standing there bawling and everything. And like, he knew him also. So like he was crying also. He had come across him in many different ways. You know, one of the stories that I tell about his life, just to kind of give people like a little bit of a window into his, into the type of person that he was, his rabbi. And there's a few stories that I t tend to tell, you know, one is that, you know, there was a family, one of his neighbors who was on their way out of town on a trip and their, their vehicle broke down. And I think he went and picked them up or maybe it broke down by their house. It doesn't matter. The point is, you know, here's somebody who needs to go away for the weekend and their vehicle just broke down and they're stuck. And he basically like handed them his key and said, here, take my car. And they're like, wait, no. He's like, just take my car, go. You know, some other stuff is like, he was, like I said before, he was the eighth grade teacher. And so he was the one who would guide many, many eighth grade students into what high school would be best for their, for their abilities, for the type of person they were, for the type of family they came from, et cetera. And so people would even call him up randomly and say, Hey, I know that you do this. Can you tell me where my son should go? He'd be like, I, I don't know your kid. Like he's not in the school that I teach in. He's not here. I, I, I don't know. Him. I can't, I can't help you. And they're like, you know, for most people, that's the end of it. But for him, it wasn't the end of it. He's like, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you like why don't I study, you know, the Bible with them a few times, you know, like for the next two weeks, we'll study every single night, 30, 40 minutes, whatever. I'll, I'll gain a connection to the kid. I'll know them a little bit better. And then I can recommend what place to go to, hmm. you know? Hmm. So just really an extraordinary man in the sense that he was just constantly giving and constantly helping people and, and just bending over backwards to do like tremendous, tremendous things for people. But yeah, I mean, that, that was, that's the basic thing. And that, and that, that set off a tremendous amount because that was 10 years old. And then I had issues with the school. We, I probably, I don't know, whatever. I mean, I had issues with the school and then, and then I ended up being kicked out of that school and then I ended up in another school. But, you know, I, I ended up essentially being a dropout by the time I was 14. Ostensibly, I was in homeschool. <laughs> meaning, meaning we bought a few homeschool courses and I was doing uh -huh. them supposedly, but I wasn't actually doing them. And then, you know, I, I ended up getting a GED and going to college and stuff like that. But like, there were a lot of wayward years, at, years after that in the sense that just, I don't know, it's, you know, everything's a struggle for everybody and we all go through our own battles. We all go through our own process to get to the places that we get to. We never know necessarily which things, let's say coming again from that, from that, you know, God's running the world type mindset. We never necessarily know which of the things that, you know, God is like, this is going to happen to you, whether you like it or not, or like, this is going to happen to us because we're going to make it happen to us because we're like stubborn and, you know, put ourselves into situations that maybe we would be better off being in. But what was it about that event? Do you think, I mean, obviously this is, as, as you said, it's a big trauma and for, I'm picturing, you know, the, the 10 year old kids all kind of standing around and being like, what's going on here and like for some reason it's sort of it reminds me of almost like a stephen king novel or something right where there's like <laughs> young kids who are like there's this crazy thing that happened and like you just you can't really wrap your brain around it but for you it sounds like something about that looking back you feel like set off this chain of events where you got kicked out of school you were sort of learning at home do you have any sense as looking back on that so now? The, kick, the getting kicked out of school, I don't think had very much to do with that event in particular. Okay. Would I have been kicked out of school anyways? It's hard to say. I mean, I mean, I mean it, it wasn't just this one event that was a catalyst for everything that happened in my teen years. You know, when I got kicked out of school, it actually, I think, was the decisions made by the school administration that set that off and, uh, and I can explain very briefly. First of all, they, for inexplicable reasons, I've been told reasons, but they're so, they're so cynical and horrific that if they're true, I don't even want to think that they're true. So like, mm -hmm. whatever, but like okay. for the, okay. they, the, the next two years, 
they gave us brand new teachers for the Hebrew studies and Hebrew studies is the big bulk of the day. They gave us brand new, fresh teachers when like they had teachers that had like 20, 30 years experience and they gave us people who were brand new. I, you know, and, and were they just worried? strange for like a bunch <laughs> of what? Were they worried that like they didn't want know. to hire any older teachers that they might have health issues or something? Is that... oh, 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 no, 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 no. Okay. What I'm saying is, is that like, when you have a teacher who's around for 20 years and doing it for 20 years, even if you give them a class that's been traumatized, they should have the skills to sit there and like recognize this kid is having trouble. Let's get him some help. This kid is having this. Sure. Let's get him some help. You yeah. use a brand new teacher straight out of, you know, college or whatever. They don't have a baseline, basically. So mm, they, I, I don't think and they don't have a baseline to sit there and say, well, these kids are struggling. So they, for them, it was just like, it's going to be a really crazy class. It'll be the next year. And then you're going to you know, have a lot of experience, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. But, but it for two yeah. years, they gave us that. Then for the, for in seventh grade, they had a lot of trouble with their, the English staff. You know, they brought a guy in who was very experienced, but he had, he had health problems and they brought somebody else and he was there for a couple of days. He left and they brought somebody else and he was there for a couple of days and left. And then, so mostly that we were getting like, you know, substituted by this one person. And then they brought in another teacher and they hired this teacher. And I don't know that they ever should have hired this teacher. He was a monster. Yeah. And I'm saying he's a monster based on just my memories of how he ran the class, not getting into whether or not he actually is a monster. I do know that I have, I have classmates who, when I asked them about those, that period of time, they're like, I've blocked that whole thing out of my memory. Don't even talk to me about it. Mm. It's possible that he, I mean, I don't know. He was just, I don't think he was a very good person. Okay. Um, and, you know, maybe that went further, but basically they, they came up with a, with a, with a policy that was, sorry, I'm just, just going to finish this thought. Yeah. I know I'm taking a long time. I'm sorry, but okay. basically came up with a policy, get kicked out of his class three times. We're suspending you for a week. Right. They were having a lot of, of behavioral problems because we hated this guy, like to the nth degree, like it was an awful, awful, awful experience. So I got kicked out the third time and they suspended me for a week. It was the week before my 13th birthday, the week before my bar mitzvah. So it was also the week before Passover, which is a big, which is like an extended holiday because it's an eight day holiday, the few days before, a few days after. So the week before vacation started, they suspended me. And when vacation ended 15, 18 days later, whatever it was, my parents were like time to go back to school. And I said, there is no way I'm stepping foot back in that school. So I stopped going and after a month or two of that, they're like, if you don't show back up to school by this and this date, we're going to expel you. And I said, guys, hello, <laughs> I already left. Right. So, so saying that I got kicked out was summarizing a lot of other things going on over there, but whatever, you know, so the other school took me in and, you know, I, I actually did fairly well there, I think, but, you know, started hanging out with kids who were, we, we all together just kind of started heading down the wrong path, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, so was it the main catalyst? Maybe, maybe not. You can certainly l find where it led to areas where I was, I wasn't doing so great. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So whether or not that was sort of the main catalyst is definitely something that sticks out in your brain as sort of this important event. And definitely. then all of these other kind of dominoes that, that started falling. You had, it sounds like your classmates were maybe also traumatized by this other teacher. Do you Definitely. have any sense like looking at the, because I'm hearing kind of a couple of traumas there, did these contribute to any feelings of anxiety for you? And do you have a sense of that looking at? Yeah, I mean, they definitely, they definitely don't help. I'll tell you two, two events that like pop out of my mind and I wouldn't call it necessarily clinical anxiety. Yeah. If you're a clinician, maybe you would, <laughs> but no, two, two events that like pop out of my mind that I would say are directly related to these two events, probably. So one event was, it was a really weird thing. My older brother and my father were heading on a plane to a school to check it out for my older brother. And maybe they were just going on a trip. Cause I'm like thinking of the timeline, cause whatever they were, they were going somewhere, you know, and I believe it was on a plane. Mm -hmm. And I got like this, I was in class, I was in sixth grade and I got this like premonition, I think. I, I'm going to call it a premonition. I don't know if it was actually a premonition because clearly nothing happened, but I got this like awful, awful feeling like something awful was going to happen. And I like completely fell apart. And like the teacher was like, let me help you. Can I do this? Can I do that? And I'm just like, you know, just bawling and everything, like falling apart, like something terrible is going to happen. I, so, so. 
So I don't know, obviously, you know, when nothing happens, maybe I was just, you know, having the effects of this other death that had happened to me, mm-hmm. you know, a few years beforehand, mm-hmm. maybe something was going to happen. And because of, you know, the way that I reacted, maybe it changed something in the, in the metasphere. I don't know, whatever, you know, but yeah. like, I would say that regardless of like, without getting into the metaphysical, the reaction there probably had, you know, a direct correlation to what had happened to me a few years beforehand. Yeah, um, I, I think that would only make sense. I mean, I, yeah, I just don't right, think right, you can, saying. you know, have sort of event or events like that happen and not have it affect you to the point where you're expecting that something else like that can happen again. Yeah, I've always been a little bit more, I mean, maybe from this, maybe not. Like I have this, it's a very weird combination because I have like a very positive nature, but also like a kind of like a morbid <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no, like, but I think a lot of us have that. But so I'll tell you a trick that I use for that in a second. But, but the other event is so we had, I had this teacher in seventh grade that was like a massive, massive problem. And, you know, maybe there were other events in my life also. I don't know. But I was working at this place. I'm not going to go into detail for clear reasons. And, you know, it was like a snowy day outside. And so I had, I had come on a scooter. You know, and so now it's like, you know, the snow's like pouring down. It's like nasty weather outside. And so the, 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 the manager, I was like, do you mind if I just, or if you're driving past my house or whatever, do you mind just giving me a ride home? And he's like, yeah, sure. No problem. So we both stayed a little bit later than everybody else did. And I, you know, picked up extra hours or whatever. And we're getting ready to leave ish, you know? And so it was like a very normal event. But for some reason, it triggered me like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that had something to do with like my seventh grade time. But you you know how like a lot of times men in in certain areas, like clearly not like in a room filled with men and women usually, but, you know, men will often like, you know, unzip their pants to tuck in their shirt. Yeah. Right. Right. So he started like, you know, undoing his pants to zip it to like tuck in his shirt and like, like massive, massive Mm -hmm. like anxiety and everything. I'm like... Mm-hmm. Then he starts tucking his shirt. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like a weird event. So there, there's that. But so the, talking before about the morbidity and like focusing on death and like the worst case scenario and what could happen and stuff like that. So like yeah. I've got a big imagination. I know a lot of people do also. Uh-huh. And you know, so sometimes I might start thinking about like worst case scenarios and like, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And it happens. You know, I'm saying we we all like you know daydream and sometimes our daydreaming takes us into less helpful places but one thing that i do if my mind is trying to grab a hold of something and like get me scared of something or get me like whatever or what if this happens or what if that happens i tell myself i'm like yeah you know what like lots of crazy things happen what, what do i say exactly it's like a lot of crazy things could happen but the vast majority of them won't happen right so you know it's a situation where somebody's like about to put them into this place where they might be a little bit scared. They might be a little bit nervous. They might be a little bit this. And they start thinking about, well, what if there's a terrorist attack? Well, what if there's a this? What if the building collapses? What if there's a this? Or what if there's a that? You know, a great example is like going caving, right? I mean, caving is a great example just because it's a, when all precautions are taken and when it's done the right way and, and, you know, et cetera, especially if you're doing it with a guide who has a map of the cave, who knows the cave, really, 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 really well, there's very, very, very little that could actually happen that would be like a massive problem in the sense that like the rocks on top of you are just not going to fall down. Right. But do they, it doesn't happen. Yeah. I mean, one in like, you know, a bajillion chances of it or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. But like when you have caves that like was like carved out with like water and limestone and everything else, like, you know, depending on what calendar you want to use, it doesn't make a difference thousands of years ago. Right. Meaning because of the, uh, you know, the biblical calendar or the nine, but whatever, it doesn't make a difference. It's been there for so long. The rocks are not just going to fall typically. Right. But like when right. people are down there, they get nervous. Like, well, what if the ceiling falls in? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lots of crazy things can happen, but most of the time they never do. Yeah. That's a nice uh, mantra, I think, to use to try and keep yourself in the you know, the present moment and mitigate that sort of catastrophizing thinking, which is, you know, it is kind of one of the hallmark traits of anxiety is that projecting out into the future and worrying about what things are going to happen. So tell me more about what happened like after, so you, you're, you're out of school and you're, where, where did you go from there? And how did you feel like, you know, these, the sort of traumas or anxieties and stuff like influence that 
path for so you. So when people, when people ask me, you know, some people say to me sometimes like, where'd you go to high school? You know? Yeah. And I, I just answer them with the name of the pizza shop that I worked in for, for my high school years. <laughs> well, hey, I hope that was like George Washington pizza shop or something. And maybe that. No, I mean, it's, it's, a little... a, it's like a local pizza shop uh, okay. in Baltimore. I grew up and everything. And so, you know, they're like, oh, and then, you know, they, they kind of have to like process it for a minute. And I guess they're like, oh, right. Okay. Drop out. Fine. It depends on the company that I'm in. You know, a lot of times if the way the questions asked or whatever, depending on, you know, like for instance, a lot of times people will ask the question, where'd you go to Yeshiva, which is just a general rule for like a study hall, basically. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So usually a lot of times they might mean high school. They might mean, you know, the, during the college age years, uh -huh. but you can answer it in different ways. And like, so like I did go to a place much later when I was like in my twenties and stuff. So a lot of times I'll just answer that and then that'll like get rid of the question. But you know, sometimes when I want to like get like a little reaction or something, I'll be like pizza shop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of years there and, you know, I ran across many different groups and, you know, different people doing different things. And some of them were kids in high school, some of them weren't. I'm not sure, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out which, which part. Yeah. I'm trying to figure, just get a sense of what kind of things specifically do you feel like, uh, happened as a result of this sort of, you know, having this early trauma and maybe having some anxiety around it. Did you try to sort of, some people try to self-medicate for anxiety or they try to distract themselves in some way from life. So maybe... I don't know if it was specifically anxiety uh, that I was experiencing, but I mean, certainly during my teenage years, you could see that I self-medicated a lot. Okay. You know, that the people I was with and the, and these things that I was doing was all focused a lot around partying and, and, you know, having fun or, you know, whatever people, you know, whatever euphemism you want to use. Yeah. Ultimately, I don't think that, you know, it take, sometimes it can take a while before you realize that, like, it just doesn't actually help. There may be some things done in moderation that maybe could help, but, you know, often what people are doing to try and like, I guess, forget about stuff like that doesn't necessarily help. Like a lot of times, like fix, focusing more on, on again, right. You know, if somebody has got clinical anxiety, they may probably need help from a clinician or whatever. But like, if somebody's just feeling anxious a lot and they don't like bridge, you know, cause that's the hard thing that we have, right? There's a lot of people who may be feeling anxious and maybe feeling anxiety, but maybe they don't meet the diagnostic criteria to sit there and like actually be treated. Sure. Yeah. Or, or they don't want to be treated or, you know, yep. there's a lot of different scenarios in which case, but, but, you know, the one thing that I would just preface is like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's never a bad idea to go in and, and have diagnostics done and check into it because some people would maybe really benefit from help and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, help can really take people into a much different place. And some people actually need help. Like they, they won't be able to function in fully until they actually get that help. But mm -hmm. all that being said, Self-medicating, I don't think is, we're, a lot of us are going to do it and they're going to try it, but it's not, it's not an end all be all. It's not a good goal to have because it doesn't put us into a place where we can fully, truly function. You know, we need to, we need to sit there and find those things that help, uh, help bring us down. And I don't mean to press down, but bring us down from that heightened sense of, oh no, what, uh, you know, like just exactly, everything's, yeah. everything's like attacking at the same time to bring us mm -hmm. into more of a calm peaceful place. And, and, you know, so one thing that I, I personally use now, as opposed to self-medicating is nature, you know, and mm -hmm. nature has that effect on everybody. Not mm -hmm. everybody will recognize that effect in themselves, but nature has that effect on everybody in the sense that there's more and more studies coming out now that, that, you know, a certain amount of time in nature per day, per week, whatever is, is tremendously, tremendously healing. I think I was scared of nature for a long time. I was going to say, it's interesting that you uh, went back to it after. Yeah, no, it took, me, yeah. it took me a long time. It took me a long time to really get back to it. I really like when I was 14, I was sent on an hour bound trip. I, it was, so that was amazing. And mm -hmm. I really wanted to go into a career based on the nature. And for some reason, and I, I suspect that I know the reason now, but for some reason, I always kind of put it off and just stayed away from it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think I realized a few years ago when I was hiking in the Cleveland area with the Cleveland Hiking Club that I think I was a little bit nervous, a little bit scared to like be out in nature, even though it's, it's irrational, right? I mean, I grew up playing in the forest behind my house, right? I grew up running around the woods all the time. I I have a lot of the skills, not all of them, but I have a lot of the skills necessary to sit there and go. And, you know, even back then I'm saying, not now, 
yeah. to go ahead and, and be out there safely. Like, you know, so, so why would I be nervous about being out there? But, but I think that there was an element of fear and an element of, of, of that. But at this time, I feel like I've basically conquered it. Mm -hmm. You know, I got my wilderness first responder and I'm very comfortable going out hiking by myself, middle of nowhere, no problem. I do do risk mitigation stuff. And the one thing that I am not that good at, but I should be better at is, you know, making sure to tell people where I'm at. But a lot of times the reason why I'm not that worried about that is because I'm not going deep, deep back country where I'm parking my car in the middle of nowhere, where like, you'd have to hope that somebody crosses, you know, cause there's that story of the guy who got stuck be between the rock and the Canyon wall. Oh yeah. His I car was parked movie. in the middle of nowhere. Like he mm -hmm. has to like, he has, you'd have to like find his car. So like a lot of times when I'm going out and I forget to tell my wife where I'm going or whatever, mm -hmm. my car is parked in a state park in Pennsylvania that is regularly, you can't find parking in the parking lot, let's say. Right. Mm -hmm. So like if my car is there, at night, my car is there the next morning. They'll be like, yeah, this car's not supposed to be here. What's going on? You know, mm -hmm. like that'll be a pretty clear marker. But yeah, I mean, it, anytime if you are going outdoors, it's always a good idea to tell somebody where you're going to be, especially if you're alone. And it's a good idea to learn a little bit about being safe outdoors. But all that being said, there is almost nowhere that you can be in, in the United States, Canada, and probably in many other countries in the world as well. They, there's not a version of nature that you can get to without knowing a lot and without sitting there and necessarily worrying about, am I dressed correctly? Am I worrying about cotton? Am I worrying about this? In the sense that the health benefits that I've read about can come from something as simple as finding a small, like, nature-ish park that like you park and the max place that you can go is like let's say a half a mile away from the parking lot or something because there's nowhere else to go so so even though you know you can find places where you can go and take 10 50 mile hikes if you want you can find a lot of places that are within a 10 to 30 minute drive from your home that you can park the car and there's nowhere to get lost because there's not a big enough park you know it's mm -hmm. a you know there's a lake near you there's some trees there's a small forest there's this tons of stuff without getting into the back country and so if you talk to outdoors people you're not supposed to go outdoors unless you're wearing non-cotton stuff so that if it rains so that if it, this happens if that happens but if you're parking your car and you're going for a walk for 20 minutes and you're in the middle of nowhere you know, right and you're wearing cotton well so if it rains and you get cold you're 10 minutes away from your car you know right. yeah um so I, i'm a big proponent of, of getting out doors and just being outside a little bit more. And if the bugs bother you, you can, there's all sorts of things you can use. You know, you have bug bracelets and all sorts of stuff like that. And the health benefits for people with anxiety, for people who are anxious for anybody is just, it's just myriad health benefits. And it reminds me a lot of easy. when, yeah, it is. I mean, right. You just kind of put on your shoes and, and make it happen. It makes me think of going for a run or something, right? Like, Exerc oh yeah. Yeah. Exercise yeah. is, exercise is so also for anxiety and stuff like that. A lot of times I feel like it's pent up yeah, and it's gotten no better during the pandemic, but it's like, we're like stuck and we're like, okay, I have to do this and I have to do this and I have yeah. to do this and I have to do this. And it's like, well, why don't I have anxiety when I was a kid? And it's like, because when you were a kid, you went to school mm -hmm. and an hour into school, you went out for recess and you ran around straight for 15 minutes, came back inside, and right. then you ran around again by lunch, and then you ran around again later in the day, and then you came home and you sat there and you were outside all day. You're playing soccer, playing football, playing baseball, playing this, and you were playing all this stuff, and you're so active. And then you get to the point where you're like working and everything, and you're like, I'm so anxious. Why am I so anxious? And it's like, because you're not doing anything. You're right. Yes. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, and it's oh, like. Oh. Burn some energy. Totally. And it, the, the, it's easy when you're a kid because it's kind of more like your natural state. Once you get older, it's that first step that's always the hardest one. It's that first one of like getting out the door. So and then you, you get out there and you're like, oh, why am I not, not doing this more often? All the time. Right. Yeah. So I just yeah. finished listening on my, uh, I was driving yesterday. I just finished listening to Scott Adams' book, uh, How to Fail at Everything and All, at, at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Uh -huh. And um, he, a lot of interesting stuff in there. But one thing was that he was talking about systems versus goals. It's that's a much longer discussion. That's not the point of what I'm saying. But one of the things that he said is that he's got a system of be active every day. So instead of being like, I have this, you know, I have to run five miles a day. I have to run 10 miles a day. I have to do this. I have to do that. His, his goal, his system is to be active every single day. So if today being active means taking a walk around the block for 15 minutes, and then tomorrow is a more intense thing, that's fine. As long as he's active every single day, that's one thing. And the, the reason I brought it up really it's because of what you said, right? There are studies, you're bringing it up and, and there's science backing it. I believe it's mm -hmm. uh, from the power of habit or something, mm -hmm. or maybe it's from another book. Maybe it's Atomic book, Habits, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah. right, the first 15 to 20 seconds, if you can overcome that obstacle 
you'll get into it. You know, what's his face also talks about it in the happiness advantage, I think, Sean Accor. But, you know, making it slightly easier to go ahead and do that thing, it has a, makes it much more likely that it'll actually happen. And the reason I bring all that up is because in his book, he talks about how his system is. And he's like, well, there are days when I don't want to be active. So the first thing that I do is I tell myself, okay, so just change into your exercise clothing. And even though I change into my exercise clothing, I still don't have to exercise. Because if I said, well, now that you're in, you have to exercise, then I wouldn't be able to get my body to do that one little step. So I changed my exercise clothing. And I say, hey, do I have the energy now to go out and exercise? And if the answer is still no, I take them off and I go back to whatever I was doing. Right. But like we were saying, like that first step, sometimes the hardest. Well, if you give yourself permission to take them off after you've put them on and you still don't feel like doing it, then it might be more likely to put them on. Mm -hmm. But then it sits there and sets off the, you know, what people call like subroutines that then bring you more into that, that point of like, oh, yeah, I will go exercise. Yeah. And there's momentum that happens from that. And yes. uh, just just doing it in some fashion every day, no matter what that looks like or you know whatever or if it, for you if it's every other day whatever it is it's yep. just the fact that the the pattern is there that makes the difference and you don't have to run five miles you can as you were saying earlier just sort of being outside and being out uh in nature in some way it was making me think of uh, i used to live in new york city for uh, about six years and I, I remember. Sorry to hear that. No. <laughs> yes, right. so, I'm a I'm a recovering New York City dweller. I'm a recovering. Uh, I'm a recovering New Yorker. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, but I remember going to Central Park or going to Prospect Park when I was in Brooklyn, and the difference between I mean, and it's so there's such a sharp divide. You know, if you look at an aerial shot of New York City, you see the rectangle of green. Yep and everything else that's around it. So you literally just cross the street and you go from complete mayhem to all of a sudden there's trees and all of a sudden there's grass. And what a difference. I don't think people would, it's hard enough to live there in a lot of ways, but I, I yeah. think it would feel impossible if that weren't there. So, so a couple of things about that. First of all, even though those are city-based parks that are very city oriented and you can still hear the cars honking outside. Yeah. I've been to both of them, you're right? Yeah. And, it's still like, because you can't get out into the middle of nowhere, it's still really nice because you can get mm -hmm. out and there's water and there's, there's birds and there's squirrels and chipmunks mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. else. And there's trees and all, all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. so, right. So like, that's what I'm saying that everybody has something that's accessible right? and use what you have accessible. Don't worry about like, oh, well, it has to be in Utah. No, it doesn't have to be in Utah. You don't have mm -hmm. to go to the middle of the Grand Canyon or make it work. Go mm -hmm. somewhere that's in your backyard, find something that's close, mm -hmm. find something that's feasible. And then you can talk about doing Utah or the Grand Canyon later. Later. That's one thing. The other thing is, you remember that game SimCity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like games like it? Mm -hmm. If you're building a city and you forget to put parks in your city, the people revolt. Yeah. <laughs> right? You, uh, you need somewhere to be able to go and relax and not utilizing those places to go and relax is going to have effects. And some of those effects are that we're like, holy cow. I can't think straight because I've got too much stuff going on in my brain. And it's like, yeah, because you're not burning off your excess energy. You're not sitting there. I mean, I mean, there's, there's scientific basis for everything that I'm saying. Like there's, there's a stress hormone cortisol, mm -hmm. right? And cortisol makes you more and more stressed. And, and I would urge people thinking about anxiety to read into that. Yes, maybe even more and more anxious. And I'm not saying the scientific basis for that, but the more exercise you do, the more cortisol you burn off, meaning the more exercise, the less cortisol you have in your body. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's directly correlated and it's, a, a, well, maybe not directly correlated. I don't know. You have to look in the science, but, yeah. but I'm saying it, it all makes sense, right? Like sure. your brain is a muscle. The more that you give it oxygenated blood, the more that you give it things that it needs to function, the better off it'll be, including calmer, more at home, more peaceful because, because we, we, we try to do so much and, and, you know, the one of the first things we let go of is our health and, and, you know, the things that will make us feel better and feel more calm. And, and we need to put ourselves first. It's not being, uh, this is another thing he was pointing to bring out in that book. It's not so much being selfish as it is being realistic, right? If we're not gonna be able to function with all the stuff going on, we have to focus on the things that are going on around us and focus on ourselves 
in order to, in order to be able to do anything. This, this lady that my wife was very, very close with, you know, in, in Hebrew, we call it a bat bayat or a ben bayat, basically like a daughter of the house or a son of the house, like parents that aren't really parents, you know, mm-hmm. they're not actually your parents, but it's a house that you spent a lot of time there. So you're like kind of part of the family. So there was this lady that my, that my daughter, my wife was like very, very close with. And, and like one time she like looks at her, she's like, if you don't take care of you, who's going to take care of you? Mm. And that's not precluding the husband from taking care of the wife or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Point is, is that we're only able to function at our highest level and, and to be able to be there for the people that we want to be there for if we sometimes put ourselves first. Mm-hmm. If we sometimes sit there and say, this is what I've got to do right now. Nothing else is as important as what I've got to do right this second, even though it seems selfish. It's not selfish. It's saving for a rainy day. It's, it's taking care mm-hmm. of ourselves so we're better able to take care of the things around us. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a, a great message for people who are caregivers in some sense, one way or another. And maybe most of us are, you know, you have family and relatives sure. who probably need you in some way, but even people who are professionally, if that's what they do, it's very easily to get pulled into this idea of that you have to martyr yourself to whatever it is that you're doing or whoever it is that you're taking care of. And I think you get kind of swept away in that with, with forgetting, you know, yourself and then you burn out and then you're just not able to help anybody. So uh, it's really important to remember. Can you tell us just briefly what it is that you're doing now, now that we've covered kind of this <laughs> full circle that you went from the one sort of trauma to the woods, to the healing nature of the woods. And what is it that you're working on these days? So I was for a long time building a motivational speaking business it is very, very stagnant just because of the coronavirus thing. I mean, you know, I've, I've made sure. the moves to sit there and build up a virtual version of it, mm. but virtual is just not the same. Mm-hmm. And the industry is it kind of took a massive, massive, massive hit from the coronavirus and just the restrictions and, you know, the fear and, and all sorts of other things that are going on. So while I'm not shutting that down, I am kind of like exploring other options that make more sense. You know, I did, I did revitalize what I was doing before, before I started doing that, which was design work. And, you know, I've got that, I've, you know, rebuilt that business back up. I did my book, I'm pointing behind me, but you can't mm-hmm. really see it, but I did, I, I wrote a book uh, called The Little Book of Greatness. Um, mm-hmm. So right now I'm trying to figure out like what that next thing is. And, and what I'm really looking into is I started developing a, an outdoors experiences company. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying currently to figure out how to expand that to the point where I can, you know, turn it into like a real, a real something, a real business, a real, a real way, a real source of income. And, and mm-hmm. it could be that I, I can't, I mean, I don't know. I did it just this past summer. I did a summer camp for teens. I did two different sessions. They were both very small sessions, but the kids loved it. They had mm-hmm. a fantastic time. I took them like white water rafting. I took them caving. I took them mm-hmm. uh, flying. And when I, when I say I took them, I don't mean that I'm, you know, skilled in every single thing that I take them on, but I, I, work with people who are skilled and who have the proper certifications to do stuff like that, you know, and, and so like, I'm like their main liaison to doing all these activities, but, but I'm relying on other people to be the specific guide for specific activities, depending on when and where, et cetera. Mm, gotcha. But I mean, we, they, they had a fantastic time, you know, camping, yeah. unless some of these guys are like, they've never been camping before. It's funny because people don't realize what people are capable of. Some of the mothers, when I was talking to them for one of the groups was like, my kid's never going to want to go camping never like can we just do it without the camping and i'm like yeah whatever like i'll just you know readjust the schedule like it's fine like i don't care and then like a day or two later they're they're like well i actually asked my kid and they kind of like lit up and we're like camping i'd love to go camping Uh (laughs) Uh (laughs) so it just goes to show you never know and 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 sometimes we have to take ourselves out of our own little box and put ourselves into new situations and it's like one of the things that I'm learning right now is I'm trying to learn whitewater kayaking, which I thought mm-hmm. meant signing up for a school, which I did, and then learning whitewater kayaking. But it's not quite like that. So, like for instance, like right now I'm learning how to roll a kayak, mm-hmm. which between you and me, like I've been only twice. I've done you know the first couple of lessons. I've been to only two practice sessions. I'm still pretty ter- not not entirely. I'm less terrified, <laughs> but I'm still kind of terrified about like you know being underwater, like strapped into a kayak, and you're not strapped in, but like being attached to a kayak yeah. and all, everything. Yeah. Haven't gotten the role yet. It's like very scary. It's very overwhelming. It's very yeah. like, you know, you get out there and you're like, I, like I was there like last week, I'm going again tomorrow night and I'm like on the water and I'm like, oh no, I hope I don't flip over. Like not 
I, I have to flip over at some points, but like mm-hmm. when I'm just like paddling, I'm like, I don't, I don't flip over. <laughs> but you know, it's, 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 a, we, we do much better when we're learning things and when we're trying stuff new and when we're yeah. experiencing new things and when we're putting ourselves outside of our own little box. And so, yeah. So I, I do urge people to, to continue to figure out achievable ways to put themselves outside of their own little box to like sit there and expand their skill set and expand their base and, and, you know, just give themselves new opportunities. Even if you're scared, it's okay. We're all scared. We're all scared at some point in time, at some point or another, but it's only by experiencing those things and, and working through the fear that we get to the point on the other side, which in this particular case, I haven't gotten to yet, Mm -hmm. but we get, we, we will get to that point. Right. I mean, the first time I picked up road biking, I was terrified, especially clipping into the bike. I was, I was terrified, but now I've done it so much that I was like, Mm -hmm. yeah, clipping in big deal, you know? Um, there's so much opportunity to do those kinds of things when yeah. you are outdoors and when you're being active and those small achievable little fears that you're getting over that all that all adds up it and does just as we were talking about with sort of the momentum of having the routine and doing the exercise so i think Definitely. that's uh, that's great advice for sure Thank you so much for being here today and being willing to share your story and also your advice on how to manage those feelings of fear or working through things and just reminding us all of, I think, the the healing power most of the time right outside your door in some way or another. Yeah. I can't urge people enough to get just get outdoors. Yeah. Well, thanks so much and really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. That was Ari Gunsberg. His website is AriGunsberg.com. The book that he mentioned is The Little Book of Greatness, which is at thelittlebookofgreatness.com. You can check out all of that information there. And as always, if you have comments or questions about the show, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. What are we doing well? What can we work on? Let us know. So that's it for today. Until next time, be well and be in touch. This podcast is not intended as medical or psychological treatment. In no way should it replace treatment from a mental health professional.